All right. I've got back one of my favorite guests, amazing author, amazing researcher, the creator of Immersion, Dr. Paul Zach. Paul Zach, say hi. Ian Garlic, hello. And we're going to talk today about uncovering the brain's valuation mechanism, how he predicted hit songs was his software does with 97% accuracy, developing neuroscience as a service, the way emotions value are used by the brain to value organization. What's the first thing everyone needs to do in a marketing campaign? Why Paul cries on planes, which screen size is most powerful for your visit, your video results, how the four seasons won Paul over and using staging and anticipation and the super fan effect Man, so much, plus how to live longer and be happier with their new app. All this on the Scarlet Marketing Show. And of course, this is brought to you by VideoCaseStory.com, one of the most powerful tools that we'll talk about is through storytelling. Go to VideoCaseStory.com, where we'll help you collect, craft, and deliver those amazing customer stories. All right, let's get started. I think what you're doing is amazing. And it's funny because I want to talk about I want to talk about the marketing side and also what you're doing in mental health. But you know, when I was reading Immersion, when it was like all it was like validation for me. It's like scientific validation. It's like all the stuff I've been telling people about story and moments and emotions and how powerful it is. And it's just like proving it over and over and over again. But let's talk just at a high level. What is immersion? And you know, because we've talked before about the chemistry of the neuroeconomics, et cetera, but what is immersion, your philosophy of immersion? So immersion is a neurologic data stream that my research over 20 years uncovered that as far as we can tell is the brain's valuation mechanism for social and emotional experiences. So because the brain, as you know, Ian, is very lazy, takes 20% of our calories to run, it's 2% of body weight. It just wants to idle most of the time. And so when we see this neurologic data called immersion, it's like your brain going, holy crap, this is really powerful. Like I am turned on by this. And so that's why I think immersion strongly predicts individual and market actions, because there's not that many things in our lives that really give up, gives up that emotional energy that we crave. It, yeah. And it will. And I think you you said it really well in the book where it's like it's like a lazy Republican, <laughs> and that's not a political thing, which, which pisses off all lazy and Republicans, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a political thing, like you were saying. It, it, it you want to explain what a lazy how it compares to lazy Republicans? It's nothing to do with politics, right? Right, exactly. So I just again you say things that are shocking that people will remember it. So the brain's lazy, as I said, because it takes so many resources to run, and it's Republican because. Nature is conservative. And so systems that evolved millennia ago or millions of years ago for one purpose may be maladapted in our current environment. And therefore, that's good and bad for us. It means we're going to make mistakes and humans around us are going to make sometimes poor decisions, maybe ex post. We can see that. I am talking about your dear wife, Ian. No. <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, it also means we have an opening for influence, right? So our brains are just trying to figure out how to get through life and not get smushed by a bus or something. And so, you know, and this is where marketing comes in. There are particular times in which we're more open to marketing messages. Now, we, there's no brainwashing. We still have a big prefrontal cortex. We can still say no, there's no coercion here. But there are times which we're more open to it. It is. And I want to talk a little bit about like how you just like some of the discoveries, but I think the mechanism that you've developed is super interesting because it, and it, it, there's so many people that are just guessing and you can guess and test afterwards after you make the commercial, after you send it out, you spend millions of, when you're talking about California spending $150 million on, on getting health insurance in the book, but Talk to me about the development of the mechanism for you to test this, because I think this is important for people to understand. Right. So first it started in the laboratory. So I've done about 10,000 blood draws to measure changes in neurochemicals to do a single thing. And this is funded by the U.S. government, the U.S. Department of Defense, to identify signals in the brain, neurochemical, neuroelectrical signals that would consistently and accurately predict what people would do after a message or an experience. So we were funded by taxpayers, thank you, U.S. taxpayers, to create a neurologic prediction engine. So once we did that using, again, lots of blood draws, then big machines to pick up hundreds of signals from the nervous system, and then we combine these signals. And then finally, 
because Ian, you know me, I'm a cheap bastard and neuroscience is expensive. <laughs> Companies started coming with suitcases full of money and said, hey, we read about you in the media and we want to create better marketing, better customer experiences, better training. Um, and I said, yeah, we've got these $100,000 machines. We've got 19 PhDs. We'll, we'll jet out to wherever you are, write a big check. And people would love it and they would never, ever use this a second time because <laughs> too slow, too academic, you know, too expensive. So about six years ago, we launched the first neuroscience as a service platform that applies these algorithms that let us infer brain activity in real time by putting algorithms on the cloud to data we pull from smartwatches and fitness sensors. So this means that anybody can measure what the brain loves, where people are doing interesting, cool stuff, like at home. Like, you know, a lot of these kind of neuromarketing studies, they put you in a lab, they wire you up with a bunch of crap and like... Really, does that generalize to how we really live our lives? I'm, I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. And they're also generally not measuring this, this core thing that I discovered over many years with lots of collaborators. So tons of people help me, but I'll take all the credit for now, uh, which is like, <laughs> what does the brain really value? And that turns out not to be a simple question. It's, it's actually very convolved. So we actually have to get a whole bunch of signals from the brain and smush them into one overall measure. And no one's really done that before. And that makes it you know easy to understand. Runs zero to 100, higher is better. Normal humans can understand that. Yeah, I mean, the, the book is fantastic because you really go deep into the science. And for nerd like me, it's important. But also it validates, like I, I love because if you read the book, you do a great job of explaining how deep you went into the testing of it to make sure the testing was great and the testing was solid. And when you went, the testing went wrong and went right. How, when did you feel like, hey, this is really working the right way, the, the new way of doing it? Yeah, I think it was about 10 years ago when we really started doing client facing work. I think, you know, the, the research we published in the laboratory where it's so sterile and perfect and the research assistants are all PhD students and they're super smart and well-trained. But once we had, free roaming humans in a hotel conference room or in a convention center. And we're getting data from that. And we're still able to predict outcomes. You think, okay, this is pretty exciting. We just had a, I don't know if you saw this, but we got a bunch of media last week for a, a scientific paper that came out that we showed we could predict hit songs, music people had not heard before three months in advance with 97% accuracy by using neurologic immersion and applying machine learning. Now that's important because the brain is highly nonlinear. And so we just look at kind of linear measures, you know, like a straight line, it doesn't really capture what the brain's doing. And so these data are very, very rich and they really pull out second by second how powerful new music can be, or sometimes it's not. I, d I saw that and it's just, it's, I mean, you talk about crazy and like, and powerful, but what surprised you most about that study? Because it's, it's, I mean, it's so powerful. It's like, it's like, you're, it's kind of like when you, if you read everything you say, it's like, aha, yeah, of course. But I'm sure it was still kind of surprising to you. I mean, uh, thanks for asking. Yeah, a couple things. One is that, you know, all, you know, we had a portfolio of findings and everything lined up beautifully, which doesn't always happen, right? Like just, it works so nicely, number one. Number two, we use it to kind of machine learning that, basically made models of models. So it actually created of these two neurologic variables, immersion and then kind of really super low immersion, another measure we derived from immersion. It created 800 combinations of those two variables. So we didn't, again, if you ask people they like it, will they share this music, doesn't predict at all. But these two variables seem to, but you know, I'm pretty clever, but I don't know how to create 800 combinations of two variables. So I, I can maybe guess of 30 ways, you know, some quotient, whatever product. So, you know, the, the, this kind of detailed, deep, nonlinear approach really captures what the brain's ultimately doing. And that's a pretty new and cool thing. So yeah, getting to 97% accuracy, that's crazy good. I mean, that's surprising. It is surprising. And it's, it, 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 like, it kind of upsets me in a certain way. It's like, cause it, it feels like it's taking away from art, but it's is do you feel like it's taken away from the art of it or i think it's democratizing artistic creation hmm. right so i read a couple of years ago i think the best rock and roll autobiography which is by keith richards called the life if you haven't read it listeners it is amazing see like the 60s and 70s through this 
crazy ass band, right? And all the things that happened to him. But Richards talks about, you know, the baseline as being the engine of a song. And he would go on drugs to stay up three, four days without sleeping and just work on this thing, you know, but they had earned that. Like he had so much knowledge. And Kids Richards started playing guitar when he was like five, right? So, you know, this guy just knows everything by going to bars, trying things didn't work, blah, blah, blah. So I think by measuring neurologic immersion, young artists who haven't put in those hundred thousands of hours, you know, and are hopefully are not taking drugs to stay up four nights in a row and not sleep, you know, can actually try something, get immediate feedback from their friends and family. Hey, let's tweak this, blah, 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 blah. blah. So I think anything is going to facilitate greater creativity. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I agree, right? It's, it's a tool. And we can be scared of it, kind of like AI, right? It's it's we can be scared of it, or we can really take it and use it to the next level. So, and you use this. I, I want to bring it to marketing for a second because you've done some amazing studies, and and tell me some about the some of the results that you got using immersion. I mean, especially more recent ones. Yeah, I mean, a lot of really interesting stuff. I think what's interesting is that it because we have this core evaluation mechanism of the brain. It, it works in marketing, it works in education, training. So we've been actually predicting which new reality TV shows, this is not us, it's actually, you know, subscribers to the platform, but you know, which reality TV shows will find a, a big enough audience. We have several of the movie studios using our technology to optimize theatrical movie trailers. And that's super fun. You know, they have these companies that do nothing but make movie trailers. And for a big movie, they'll bang out, you know, 10 different trailers and then measure immersion, tweak them down. So that's the sense that which is this, I think the highest use of this is really in the creative process to kind of guide you. So you get out of your own head. So those have been some of the most exciting. And the last thing, as you know, is now continuous measurement of immersion is like social connection, like the value I get from social emotional experiences. And it turns out that if you're socially withdrawn, you're not engaging with the humans, that strongly predicts depressive symptoms, anxiety disorders, and it turns out a whole host of medical disorders from heart failure to Parkinson's disease. And so for these populations, now we're making available a free app. So they begin to learn about their own emotional states and to give them goals so that they can sustain emotional fitness. They can build up that, that social buffer that we all need to really thrive. Well, that was a broad range. You, I think you asked me about marketing. I always went everywhere. So bring me back. We can talk marketing. <laughs> No, I, I, I want to go down this road because I, you know, the book itself, Immersion, I mean, I, I think everyone should listen to it. Every marketer should listen to it because it it shows the power of story. It shows the immersion of story, Be you know, but you, you mentioned humans and what was interesting to me, and I want to come back to the mental health piece, but that you, you said how important faces were in marketing and how did you like, did you measure the moments that the faces were on? What did you measure the results after seeing faces? Explain that to me a little bit more. Yeah, exactly right. So the face is, is a primary way we express emotion. And so, cause now we've got, as you know, over 50,000 brain observations on our platform and growing. And so, you know, the book basically called out those 50,000 observations and, and so readers will have sort of key takeaways, but yeah, we've seen tons of commercials in which, there are, you know, far away, you're not seeing expressions, but you zoom in on the face, you're like, oh, okay, this, and there's a spike in immersion. So, you know, I call us face freaks. We are fascinated by faces. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, for example, at eye tracking for people who suffer from autism, they tend not to make, particularly we look at this area of the face around the eyes, gives us a lot of information. And people with autism just tend to kind of look around the face and they're not kind of getting all that emotional information due to their disorder, but but most of us do. And so from a marketing perspective, right, I, I want to actually get you to have that contagion of emotion. And that's what we see with immersion. If the person in the commercial is excited, is sad, whatever, then we see that reflected in the viewer. And as you said, the best way to sustain immersion is using a narrative arc. That storytelling is the best. But, you know, we see so many ads that people have tested on the platform that are just a kind of human deficient, you know, that there, there's not enough of a human scale story. They're not that emotions. There's not that close up on face. There's not that warmth. And we have, as you know, you know, from the book, we have measured sad advertisements, happy ones, you know, 
are people moving? Does it matter, does it matter if it's a man or a woman? Not that that matters very much. What matters is story. And if that story is expressed in the emotions of the actors in that in that ad, then all to the good. For example, it's just I'm sorry, one more one more thing. I know you're trying to get a No, keep question. going, keep going. Like I'm, we, I'm just taking notes here. With the movie studios, <laughs> you know, we did some work on on script evaluation. And when you, you know, everyone reads at a different pace. If you read a script, you know, you don't get that emotional feel. But what we found is that if they used a table read, an audio file of a table read, that is professional actors reading the parts in character, great signal from emotion, for immersion, sorry, that emotional component spikes up the immersion. And now I can actually see how effective that, that script might be if it were made into a movie. So, you know, I think we need that emotional connection. And that's what, and that's what you do so well, honestly. I've seen a ton of the stuff you've made on your site. And, you know, you've, you've got to be able to convey it. And I think it's so weird that there are pros in marketing, you know, creating content or reviewing content or deciding on content that don't get that energy that I need from the human, the human story, the human conflict, the resolution of this. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny because I don't know if you stressed in your other books how much you cry at movies. But <laughs> oh no, I've been outed. <laughs> but I'm the same way. I, I'm 100% the same way. And I, and you know, it, it, like I changed my LinkedIn profile to Chief Crymaker because I like when I interview people, they often end up crying. I had someone the other day, a politician. He's like, How did you make me cry? And I'm like, I think it's because I'm empathetic. So I'm getting your feelings, reading them off you and reflecting them. And it's just like this, this feedback loop. So when you were talking about like crying on the plane, I'm like, Oh, yeah, that's me watching a movie. But I think that's it's so because it, but when you come back to what you talked about, the science of it is the more empathy that, that you draw out, the more decision-making happens. And I thought that, I think that's one of my most powerful takeaways from all of this, because it's, it's not just direct. And we've talked about this before, but I just want to reiterate this. It's not just direct decision-making, right? It's not empathy and you buy something by this specific thing. It's empathy and you'll buy anything right? <laughs> or, or donate more money. It's very, yeah, it's a very blunt system. And so I think, you know, the, the way to summarize what you said, which is exactly right, is emotion is the way the brain values experiences. If it's emotionless, even if it's a financial spreadsheet, lead with a story. So mm -hmm. many listeners know that all the professional services organizations, the McKinsey's, the Accenture's, by the way, many of whom use our technology, have been, I don't know, for at least a decade, because I was involved in training these people, always lead with a story. So I'm going to do an analysis of your business, help you reorganize, make more money, whatever. The first thing I'll do is start with a story, start with a customer story, start with a founder story. That is how we learn as human beings and how we express that something is important and numbers and spreadsheets and PowerPoints just can't do it. No, oh, and I, it would be, not, we're, we, it could be two nice guys talking about this or two guys that think they know about marketing talking about this, but this is science. Lots and lots of science, which I think is absolutely the coolest thing in the world. And I was a total yeah. skeptic before I started crying on the plane and asked my colleagues, like, what the F happened to me? I was like, well, that's kind of bullshit. And I'm not a very emotional person in general. So, you know, I'm like, this this was a kind of a weird thing. And we just started digging down to it. So it's, for me, it's like the scales fell from my eyes. I'm like, oh, story is the most effective way. That's why we've been doing this for 10,000 years at least. <laughs> that's why, you know, Socrates wrote, you know, about poetics and rhetoric and all that and, and the tool it, it's you know it's it, we feel like it's manipulative but and you come back to, you know i think the best the best example is the fact that the military funded this originally and to think that it's kind of weaponized but they use it then pretty much for good didn't they i mean to win yeah. more without yeah. hurting anyone so let's use words rather than weapons to try to persuade people to cooperate with us. And I think that's what we're doing in business as well. Like, I want to convey information to you. I say, as social creatures, we are 100% persuading people all day, every day. So I've been married 27 years. I'm still nice to my wife. I still like her to be nice to me. I'm still persuading her to, to live with this stupid ape that she married, right? So that's persuasion. I'm still trying to persuade my adult children to do things I think they should do. Now they can say no. So there is, this, if you remember, there's a section in the book on the ethics of persuasion. Yep. So 
again, as long as I'm not coercing you, as long as I'm not, you know, I, I, you have five seconds or else I'm going to kill you. And I can't do that. That's not fair. But let me at least tell this story as well as I can. And and by the way, I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of a fan of your work, Ian, but, you know, the, the multi-sensory experiences you can create. So storytelling, close up on faces, share that meaningful, authentic moment, add in music, have the right background. All that multi-sensory hits the brain with a lot more information and therefore is more impactful and can, you know, impact behavior more effectively. Yeah, I, and you, you mentioned like the close up on faces and I, I want to get into kind of like a marketing geeky study that's in there because it was surprising to me that the, the difference between the big screen and the small screen with the, and the Facebook ads. And I want to talk a little bit about that because it it it, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So this is work we did in collaboration with Facebook when they were still called Facebook yeah. <laughs> some years ago. And they were concerned, this is maybe 10 years ago, it's eight years ago, that you know everything was moving to mobile and you wouldn't have this giant monitor on your desk to, to see the ads on Facebook. And as you foreshadowed, what we found is that almost always ads on mobile, the same ads for the same people are more immersive, that is more memorable, more impactful emotionally than ads on a big screen. And the question was why? So as far as we can tell, it has to do with the connection holding, I'm holding my phone for people who are just listening, right? When I have this connection, I've got to keep it stable. I, you know, it's like an extension of my body where the screen on the wall or on the desktop is, is passive. I'm not really engaged with it somatically. So that's the sense in which if I can create multi-sensory experiences, I'm going to have a, a bigger immersion. And it, by the way, the interesting thing about immersion from a marketing perspective is not only will I remember it, right? It's highly emotional. That information is saved in memory, provokes me to take an action. You think of immersion like tension in a story, right? Mm -hmm. If you give me something to do, I can dissipate that tension and my brain wants to get rid of the tension. So I'll take an action. But finally, because of this set of neurochemicals that drive immersion, immersive experiences create a, a craving to repeat the experience. So I call that driving up customer lifetime value. I'm going to wow you now. And not only is that going to sell some stuff now, but I'm going to, holy crap, this is the best experience ever. So I'll give, if I may, a concrete example of that. Yeah. This is a 15 year old example. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, checking at the Four Seasons in Sydney. I'd stayed there a week before. I went to check back in. I drove from Canberra, the world's, world's most boring city. Even <laughs> Australians know that. And so if it's like a five-hour drive, you know, I have to drive on the wrong side of the road so I got to concentrate, you know, and all that. And uh, I get to the to the Four Seasons and the bellman, you know, opens the door for me. And he says, welcome back, Dr. Zach. Your room's ready for you. Oh, now, yeah. if you're flying me out to give a talk somewhere and you say, hey, we could put you at the Four Seasons or the W or that one, well, putting me at the Four Seasons. Like, I love these people. Like, just that little extra care. And I can tell you how we did that. But they were organized. It was personal. And it was meaningful. That's exactly what you meet, need when you're tired. You just want to put your feet up and, I don't know, not talk to a human for the next hour. It, it's funny because that brings me back to, you know, and you talk about aligning up branding. And it brings me back to one of my favorite sayings from Roy Disney Jr. He said, you know, branding is what you do to cattle and they all look the same. People buy stories. And it, it, it's that, right? It's, it, you, they did that. And then there's the Four Seasons logo right there. And now you are branded with the Four Seasons logo. And you see that every time and boom, you're taken back to that, aren't you? Absolutely. Here's my tattoo right there, Four Seasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's beautiful. And even, you know, in the book, we talk about going to Disneyland and, and measuring how immersive those rides are. But if you think about, for people who've been there or, or Disney World, like Space Mountain, it's a roller coaster in the dark. But you've got a queue. You're going through this big experience, like you're going into a space station. It's got all these lights and words. And, and by the time you get to the ride, you're so excited about whatever's happening. It's that anticipation. So... The brain loves anticipation. So sometimes I think we think we got to move into this thing real fast and tell my story, slow down, right? So I call this staging. One thing we found is if you put just a little bit of time for people to settle in and to build that anticipation for what's happening, then you're going to be more effective at influencing their behavior. Oh yeah. And they'll enjoy yeah. it more. <laughs> I'll tell you, you, you all have to listen to the book because, or read the book. I was listening to it because you, you, you mentioned that. 
And I remember the exact part of the book that you talk about anticipation because it's all about candy and taking the candy to you know, unwrapping the candy. And like to this moment, like when you start talking about that, it's so associated that my mouth started watering thinking about candy. <laughs> I love it. It's so great. It's it's amazing. And you also, because you talked about the dissipation of that tension. And I think this is a powerful thing that I have not really, I, I kind of touched on and thought about, but it's something that I'm going to start using. And the fact that you've got to identify super fans and build attention and dissipate them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think this is a huge idea because you said every company should be finding their super fans. And I think it's so important that, but almost no one's doing it. Right. The ones who are doing it tend to be the streaming services and the movie studios. They have fandom departments, but like the Four Seasons story. And I've told that story a dozen times. Has the Four Seasons ever reached out to me? I'm a super fan, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want anything from them, but they should at least send me a note like, hey, we love you. By the way, I, would, I fly a lot on United Airlines. I was in the, years ago, I was flying through Houston and, you know, I had to t- waste time between flights and I had, was in the United Club and it was this on, with a terrace, a beautiful sunset. And I just tagged it. And I'm like, you know, thanks United Club for the great flight. And they wrote back within five minutes on Twitter. Like they know it. They know the fans. They gave me a little love, right? Like they didn't have to do that. They're like, hey, we appreciate you flying with United. Cool. I'm feeling good now, right? So that's, I think, what's missing. So yeah, these super fans, you know, you can find them ex post like, because they're creating fan fiction and they're talking about it. But for these super fans, neurologically, oftentimes we find that they are not who we expect, right? They're the they're mm-hmm. segments, particularly as we're in the long tail world, segments of super fans that you might not think would be super fans. And if you can find them, they will work for you for free or for the for the small like me with United for the small. By the way, United was in the book two or three times because they've been they've done a lot of nice things for me, upgraded me and my kid and, you know, done nice things. So, you know, why not? create those extraordinary experiences that people want to share and find the people who really want to share them. It's easy to share the bad stuff. And we all have bad experiences for sure. But, you know, I think as we move into the experience economy, we increasingly want or even demand that the experiences we choose to pay for and spend our time with are extraordinary. And the super fans will give you the insight on how to make them extraordinary. It, it, and, yeah, and just it's such insight when you pay attention to your super fans. And I, I know that this works for businesses of every level because I've seen it happen. I mean, I, it, yeah, I mean, I, there's a story I can't get into because I'll start to cry. But uh, it, it's so powerful. But the, the dissipation, talk to me a little bit about dissipation and what that means and how we need to be doing that with the super fans. So let me give you the opposite example. So, as you know, we've we have done tons of uh, studies of Super Bowl commercials, sort of the pinnacle of advertising, and they all go online, right? And what drives me insane is that someone has not paid that $15 an hour intern for a wonderful ad for the Super Bowl that goes on YouTube to have a hot link for me to buy that damn thing right now. So this immersive state dissipates in 20 to 30 seconds. So once you've captured me emotionally, I really want to do something now is going to make me feel good. As you said, Ian, we've done a ton of work on donations to charity. We've even shown in a recent research, I don't don't think got into the book that the higher is immersion, when you can stop watching an ad, in this case, it was for charities, the long, the higher is immersion, the longer you watch and the longer you watch, the more you donate. There you go, right? That's the link that we want. We all have options now. I mean, we're hovering over the skip ad bar, you know, on YouTube 500 times a day. So Create this experience in which I want to be there, have authentic emotions, tell a story, have what I call product story congruence. The story should illustrate how the product resolves some problem or some crisis, right? A lot of times we see ads are like, beautiful story, drop in my logo. Yep. Okay. People just laugh. So have that story integrated, sorry, have that product or service integrated into the story and then ask me to do something. So I think, you know, for all of us who we are always selling everything. But, you know, I I talk to customers every day for our platform and you have to ask for the sale, right? I think just saying, well, here's my beautiful story. You captured me, put me to work. I'm I'm ready to go. So I think you've got to say, Hey, let's do this thing. You know, do you want 10? Do you want 20? How how many can I, can I ship you tomorrow? Right? So I, I think we have to be, we have to understand that this is very valuable for the human 
And again, they can change their mind. They can say, perfect. You know, if it's a, you know, if you're buying a house or a car, at least in most states in the US, you have three days to change your mind, whatever. So again, I think there's no coercion here. Let's be careful. And this is not, you know, don't do this for children, old people <laughs> who are cognitively impaired. Let's not do it for that. You know, I'm just talking about general marketing here. Yeah, really ask for that. So that ask could ha should happen to be most effective at a peak immersion moment. So again, you can use, swap out the word immersion for the word emotion. So I'm going to create a peak immersion moment so that I've really captured you. Now that call to action doesn't have to be at the end of my story. Oftentimes that peak immersion moment may be in the middle. So if that's the, in, you know, if that's the story of, of a closing the story arc and a story arc will have lower emotion at the end, have that ask in the middle. So we see this in movie trailers. So movie trailers are essentially half of a narrative arc. For listeners, go find some movie trailers online and you'll see that they introduce characters, they put them in an environment, then they generate some kind of crisis and now the crisis builds and no resolution. You gotta buy a ticket to find out what happens, right? So that's to me really brilliant marketing that you've got to actually set up the desire to resolve the problem with a purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, you talk a lot about you mentioned charities and it's great. And I, I had to laugh in the book because you talk about like we didn't keep the money. <laughs> yeah, we send it to the charities. Yeah, bad karma to keep to lie to people. So yeah, uh -huh. and, and what's amazing is, I mean, I've always felt marketing was essential to everything we do. Like that's what I get in marketing because I, I always felt that if you want to influence people and really change the world, you have to understand marketing. I mean, if you look at the, I mean, everyone from, yeah, Steve Jobs to Ben Franklin to Jesus Christ, we're pretty good marketers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and storytellers. I mean, they're at their mm -hmm. essence storytellers, but it's amazing to me that this is now, like you mentioned before, led into mental health and affecting mental health and overall health, which it doesn't surprise me, but I, I want to talk a little about when you discover that and how it's helping people now. Wonderful segue. So I do think there is a sacred opportunity that marketers have to create small moments of joy, of immersion for individuals. And because as social creatures, we thrive on connection, social emotional connection, marketers can, can add to that. So again, it may not, I may not want to buy, you may show me a little commercial for Huggies diapers with infants and giant eyes and just gives me this 30 seconds of joy. That's okay. I'll keep watching it. It's pleasant. So what we found is in, in collaboration with subscribers to the immersion platform that for vulnerable populations, that when we measure immersion all day, we can quantify the value of the social emotional connections that people are getting. And we have now published thresholds when you're below these thresholds for long enough that indicates that you have low mood, low energy, and you're heading towards depressive symptoms. And so because we have over 50,000 brains on the site, we now have launched a consumer-facing app for free so people can measure their own immersion in social-emotional experiences and then give them a goal, a ring to close every day so they can see not only second by second, but what are the best times of my day? What are the worst times, you know, I can look, this links to your calendar automatically. So I can just actually see how I'm doing and learn about my own emotional state and how to manage it and even manage it in groups. You can form groups, invite your friends. Now you won't see their data. You'll just see where they are in a big graph. Send them an emoji. Like, wouldn't it be great? I have a, my father's 91. I call him up. How you doing, dad? Fine. What'd you do today? Nothing. <laughs> did, you, did you, did you have dinner? Oh, I ate something. I mean, it's, it's like three word answers. But, you know, if I could actually, you know, monitor his emotional state and know like, oh, yeah, he's, he's he's doing fine. He's doing OK. So I think that's the kind of sacredness I've talked about for movies. So because these brain systems for social emotional connections are so blunt, they activate for advertisements. They activate for movies. They activate when I play with my dog who's lying at my feet. So that's my real time data right now. That smile means I'm getting more value from this than I am at baseline. I'm getting a little frowny. And my background is my psychological safety. So humans can give us joy or they can drive us insane. So for some reason, I'm a little bit stressed right now. And I'm at 43 <laughs> out of 100. But the cool thing is, again, I can link this to my calendar. I can watch in real time. I can begin to emotionally regulate. And other than the extremes, super angry or super happy, you know, how happy am I right now 
you know, if I had to self-report it, I don't really know. It's, it's not really clear. Oh, actually I'm 82. That's really high. 82 out of hundred. I, I look at, I'm in, I'm in really relaxed with you. Look at your awesome being <laughs> car life. Oh, now I'm, but so again, the base are turning to baseline. So these little moments of joy are so valuable. Here's the punchline. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No. The punchline is what we found in published research is that for individuals who have higher long-term immersion over long periods of time, months and years, they appear to, and it's my dog moving in the background. Sorry. For Looks the all good. Yeah, no. That's, so we published in our published research to find that people have more of these social emotional connections. They have higher immersion over long periods of time. They appear to gain the capacity to be more connected in the future. In other words, they, be, they learn to be more present, to be more emotionally open. And people who have stronger social ties live longer and live healthier and live happier. Mm -hmm. So it's really training our brains to be emotionally open. So us criers are learning how to do it. I wasn't a crier until I had children, but now, yeah, I talk to a person and I feel terrible sometimes, you know, if they're suffering. And so that makes me a better human being because I have more empathy. I think I'm a better friend. Hopefully I'm a better parent and spouse. And so we've got to sometimes train ourselves. Some people are naturally wonderfully empathic. So again, this is why those little moments of joy from marketing, from movies, from calling a friend are so valuable. So once you have a goal for that, man, that changes the entire world, right? Now I actually yeah. know what I should be doing and get an alert, say, hey, Ian, here, I see your friends in yeah. immersion, by the way, you need a little more love today. You need a little more connection. You know, call up your wife, watch a watch a sweet movie, maybe cry a couple of tears. That's okay. Watch a Paul Zach podcast. <laughs> That'll um, stress you out. No, no, I love this stuff. I mean, it's just amazing. I'm like, so how, okay, so we can go to Get Immersion, companies that want to measure that. And how do you get a hold of the app? The app will be, as of July 1st, will be in the app store. It's called Tuesday so that you can ensure you have the best Tuesday ever. You can get more information at besttuesdayever.com and uh, sign up to be a early adopter of this. So like I say, it's free. Again, for, for businesses that you know want this data anonymized, we'll sell it to them. But for individuals, I think it's really important. And I'm, Ian, you know, you've known me quite a while. I'm really passionate about helping people live their best lives. And if I don't know my emotional state, how can I how can I really be fully engaged and happy and and really connected to the people around me? Oh, I mean, because this brings up two ideas for me. Is I was just talking to someone yesterday about ikigai, and you're you're familiar with ikigai? Oh, what is this? So ikigai is a Japanese. It, it's it's around the long, longevity of like the blue zones, and it's that you're doing the things that give you the most fulfillment. And also being around people and have this community. And those two things are directly correlated to longevity. So basically, you have now the science between long life and in an app, which is absolutely amazing. So you can find out the right people and the right things. But also, I was just talking to one of my clients today. because He's like, he's so busy. I'm like, you need to start measuring, like figuring out what you do and what you're really good at and where you're in your flow which I'm sure directly, you know, if, if I've got the, I can write down what I'm doing and then look at this and go, oh, that's where my measurement is. And that's what I should be doing more of. And I mean, like, this is like the ultimate optimization app that you're going to charge a hundred dollars per download. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you know, we'll make money because of the data is going to be valuable and health insurance oh and others can use it. So it's interesting you mentioned that. So part of the reason we got into the digital health space was because I live in the only blue zone in the United States, which is Loma Linda, California. Yeah. It's a blue zone because it's a company town and the company is Seventh-day Adventist Hospital. So Seventh-day Adventists are a kind of an offshoot, yeah, Protestant Christian sect, I guess. And But they're vegetarian. They don't drink, they don't smoke. And they are in primarily service jobs doctors, teachers, nurses. And so we've done research funded by the National Institutes of Aging on how do these people live regularly past 100? And, you know, they are in so many studies and they're sweet. I, we were doing research on them over the course of a month. So we're going in about every day. We drew blood from these nice old people in retirement homes. And 
to be honest, I fell in love. These are mostly women fell in love with them. Like they were like my grandmothers. I would take my kids to visit them when the study was over. And it was just fabulous. They were just, just wonderful and sweet. They bring cookies for us. I mean, my team, my team of graduate students, we taking blood and bothering them and all that. And I'm like, oh yeah, we brought cookies for your team. I'm like, oh, here's the, the best. So that's the kind of service, right? It's not just your personality. It's learning how to connect to others and connecting to me really means be of service to other people. So yeah. what I try to do from a business perspective, and this is a trick I'll just give away is to try to end every business conversation with the word service. Right. So Ian, how can I be of service to you in the future? What can I do to help you? Not about making money, right? It's about building relationships. Yeah. No, it, it is. It is. And this is amazing. And I think this is a great place. I mean, we're, we're almost up with our time. And I think this is a great place to end it because it's it's like this was the ultimate podcast. We'll talk about that. But so get immersion.com next Tuesday. Is it next best is, Tuesday ever? Ne- the best Tuesday ever. Best Tuesday best, ever. Best Tuesday there's a, ever. There's a little joke in there that if you read, if you go to the website, you'll see it. All right. So we'll make sure people go to it. And you, you're really active on LinkedIn. We'll put a link, link to your LinkedIn profile on there. It's a great place to follow. So much immersion news in there. So much, so many great studies on marketing. And I think every marketer needs to be following you. Every, we'll put links to the books. I think every marketer needs to read all of these books at least twice. But Dr. Paul Zach, thank you so much for being on the Garlic Marketing Show again. Ian Garlic, you're the best, man. You're an amazing human being. So thank you so much for having me back. And I'm a huge fan of yours. You know that. I appreciate it. And a huge fan, obviously, of yours. Well, thank you all for taking Dr. Paul, Zach, and I on your journey. Make sure to download his books, and we'll talk to you soon.